Hello and welcome back to Hemophyte Breakdowns. Today I'm going to talk about Bicorno. So some of you may have noticed that in a previous video, uh, I basically did a Bicorno video. I just didn't call it Bicorno because what I wanted the video to be about was uh, looking at a guard you hadn't seen before and trying to assess and work around it. And in that particular case, a person had held a Bicorno, honestly, in a way that I hadn't seen before, uh, because even for a Bicorno, it was held in a very unusual place. And it was started from a ready position, which to this day, I have never seen and probably will never see again, unless it's that person. Uh, but this is going to be about Bicorno in the usual way that I see it. And specifically, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Bicorno is exactly the position that this person on the right is in right now. And that is basically where you sort of have a... Uh, I don't really know how to describe it other than to say that it's kind of like a plow stabbing position that has been wound up onto the opposite side, but with an unusual hand grab position. And the intent of it is to kind of drive down the point of the longsword as you sort of would if you were holding a dagger in your hand. Basically transforming the sword from a low to high stab position to a high to low stab position. And there's a bunch of mechanical reasons that you would do this. But specifically, we're going to watch this exchange. And what I want to point out is that this Bicorno is launched from a transition period. Now, this is what I think Bicorno is best at. And that is first being thrown as a faint undercut here, which you see uh, the person on the right do, which is they faint this kind of undercut that you can kind of tell, at least when you pause the frame like this, that that's not what they're really doing. But when you faint this particular motion, when someone sees your point go low and your hands start to come forward, they think, oh, here comes the hand shot from underneath. And they generally lower their guard or try to uh, aggress your point and your sword at the level that they think you're coming to come at. So this person on the left kind of extends their guard out to try to accept the bind or accept the cut from where they think it's coming from. And as a result, they lower their hands ever so slightly below their shoulder level and start pointing their tip down to, you know, engage with it. The problem is, is that the whole point of Bacorno is to trick your opponent into lowering their own guard so that your high hand position can be used to put the point and the strong of your sword over the strong of their sword. And as you see, as this comes forward, the stab goes right for the face but critically, as it gets closer, it starts to immediately go down into the chest. And what this means is that the Bacorno thrust, I guess if you want to call it that, is very, very difficult to displace upward. And if you watch some of my other videos and you watch me fence especially, and a lot of people too, they are huge fans of cron parrying up. And for good reason. We're human beings and our shoulders do a hell of a lot better job going downward than they do going upward. Downward cuts are always significantly easier than upward cuts, both for target, both for distance, both for timing and strength and structure, everything. So people do them predominantly all the time. It's that gut instinct reaction. So when you throw a Bacorno and you trick your opponent into lowering their guard into a lower position, the natural instinct for any person is to take their lowered guard and shoot it straight up. And the way they do that is by croning. They take their cross guard, they flatten it out horizontally, and they push it up into the air. And what that normally does is take a descending cut and intercept it halfway and then push it up out of the way, and essentially putting the guard directly into the path of the cut or the thrust and then pushing it harmlessly off to a position where it can no longer hit. Because the Bacorno starts high and levers over the top as it's doing here, you can't push up very easily for two reasons. One is that by the time you're pushing up, they can simply raise their hands higher and get a higher lever position, which is almost inevitably what's going to happen. And two, you are going to be pushing up against the strong or the mid of the blade rather than the tip. So if you cut down from like an Oberhau, generally what happens is that your hands are, are basically moving in a... Uh, uh, an angle steeper than your blade, meaning that if you were, you know, taking like a, a line and drawing it down the, uh, the person's attack, the surface that they're trying to hit is generally horizontal. They're throwing this 45 degree angle attack and their hands are going to have a steeper 45 degree angle than their sword. And what that means is that when you're trying to parry, you would theoretically be able to strike the hands with a horizontal plane 
before you would strike the sword. What the bakorna does is it reverses this angle. So now instead of the hands leading the cut motion, the hands are trailing the cut motion. And when you're trying to cron parry upwards, what this means is that instead of engaging with the higher part of the sword because it's fa uh, falling further behind the hands, you're engaging with the lower part of the sword because it's coming at you and getting closer to the target before the hands are telegraphing their motion by going upwards. So... What results is that the second you get this overbind with your Bacorno, and in this case, it maybe just barely misses over the left shoulder, but still a good Bacorno regardless, you're placed in a position where you not only have to push your hands up in order to defend yourself from this thrust, but you also have to make sure that you push it off to one side or the other, because unlike with an overhow or even a thrust that comes from low up till high, you have this extremely straight angle that's actually above the level of the shoulders, which means that even if you push this up, it's very, very likely that uh, it's just going to plant somewhere up further on in your face rather than having the steeper angle when thrusting from below and you know harmlessly glancing maybe off the top of your mask or just coming very close to your face but never quite reaching. So in this next clip, I want to showcase uh, the differences between a Bicorno and a Shielhow, because in some ways, mechanically, they are trying to achieve the same goals, but they both do them in very different ways, and one, I think, achieves it in a far more productive way. So we'll watch this exchange, and you see a pretty classic Shielhow here, where the fencer on the left starts from their classic Vom Tog, and as soon as they... Uh, extend their arms forward. They flip their sort of hands upside down a little bit. You can't really see it because of the blur, but if you watch carefully on this right hand, the thumb goes from being on the, basically the exact back of the shield of the sword to being on the left side of the sword. And what that basically means is that it transitioned and attempted to lock out the right side. As that happened, of course, uh, the fencer on the right attempted to sweep in that exact same angle due to the structure and the rotation. They didn't quite have enough oomph to get it offline in time. And it kind of plants in the chest before it uh, sort of folds in half because it's, you know, we use flexible swords and weird things happen like that. But what's worth pointing out here is that just like the Bacorno, the point of the shield how is to get a position in which your arms, your sword and your shoulders are all positioned higher than your opponents. Um, and if you read uh, a lot of the sources that have shield how, they tell you to use it whenever your opponent is in these lower guards, specifically a guard maybe not so much uh, like what they're in right about here. This is really more of a high guard, but potentially right here. If you were to make the decision right now in this position to throw a shield how, it would be a pretty ideal place to do it, specifically because when you come in straight, and I think it was a little bit of a coincidence that uh, the person on the right had just rotated a little bit too low in this motion that they were doing and kind of uh, bought themselves a little bit less of like a fraction of a second than they needed to really clear that uh, that thrust. But as the shield how comes in, because it gets this high bind, this high lever over kind of action, it it has the same sort of qualities of a Bacorno. The problem is, is that it doesn't have the same hand position. So look, uh, thinking back to the Bacorno, the advantage that it had was that it allowed you to continue to raise your hands up as needed, depending on how much force upwards your opponent gave you. The shield how does not allow for this. And one thing you've probably noticed if you tried shield house for a while is every once in a while you throw one and then your sword pops right out of your hand straight up into the air. And the reason for that is that this wrist rotation that you do for the shield how places the weak part of your hand, basically the uh, the side of your hand closest to your pinky, on the same side of the sword and pointing up. So basically, uh, and if you could see the hands better, you would maybe be able to see it better, but uh, basically both thumbs right now are on the same side of the grip of this sword. And as a result, when this lands, there's a possibility that this kind of force from the flex of the blade 
could have pushed upwards and pushed it right out of the pinky side of both of this person's hands. And again, like we've all had that happen before. And the reason it happens is because despite the fact that the shield how similar to Bacorno is trying to get that over lever to take advantage of that uh, upward motion and try to stuff it. The problem is that the hand position you need to be in for the shield how does not allow your hands to go up even an inch higher before you completely lose your sword. The, the human body can only bend the wrist down so far while rotated before it starts getting peeled out of your grip. The Bacorno completely nullifies this by putting your hands in a position where they physically can, uh, they, they're basically all the bending force is going against your fingers and your knuckles in the strongest position that your hand can be in. And you're in a kind of double hammer grip. So both of your hands have great structure and great stability, and they can freely rotate with their wrists forward and backward exactly as needed. So in my opinion, if you get good at the kind of feint that you need, I think, in order to set up a good proper Bacorno, or you just get very used to stabbing over the top of other people's guards, the Bacorno can be extremely advantageous for ensuring that you never get into a situation like this where you have to basically raise the point of contact of your body extremely high just to prevent that sword from creating a, a kind of shearing pop-out force against the top of your hand and, you know, basically preventing you from getting more of that high angle that you need. All right, that's going to be it for today. If you'd like to see your own footage featured on the channel, feel free to send me an email over at hemophytebreakdowns at gmail.com, and I hope to see you next time.